Good morning, Wesley, and welcome to this fourth Sunday of Advent. If we were in person, we would be celebrating this final Sunday before Christmas with a reading on peace. We've already covered hope, love, and joy. So today is peace. We would hear a reading from the book of Isaiah. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And then we would watch as the three purple and one pink candle of the wreath of Advent were all lit. We would recognize we are progressing closer and closer to the birth of Christ and to his return. And we would sing one more time a verse from O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. O come, thou key of David, come and open wide our heavenly home, the captives from their prison free, and conquer death's deep misery. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. This morning's Old Testament lesson comes to us from 2 Samuel, Chapter 7, verses 1 through 11 and 16. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more, and evildoers shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And our gospel lesson this morning comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and on his kingdom there will be no end. 
Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. The angel departed from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. And all God's children declare, thanks be to God. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Everlasting Father, as we come before you this day, we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of the hearts and minds of all those who hear my voice be pleasing and acceptable in your sight for you alone are our rock our redeemer and our sustainer amen perhaps this morning's gospel reading is familiar to you already it is the story of the angel gabriel announcing to mary her pending pregnancy and the promised birth of a specially anointed child to be named jesus it is paired with the reading from Samuel because the announcement of Gabriel is the fulfillment of the, prof of the promise that was given by God through Nathan to David. Um, it's a beautiful picture in so many ways, um, the, the full coming around of this promised um, kingdom forever. But we get it in the picture of a teenage girl engaged to be married, finding out she's pregnant as a virgin. It's not quite a pretty picture when we, when we put it in those, those terms. Um, in a lot of ways, the people in the church, we've become so familiar with this story, with the birth of Christ, that we forget the scandal, the depth of pain, the humiliation, and probably terror that were involved to some extent for Mary. I mean, when was the last time that we considered a teenage pregnancy out of wedlock as a beautiful blessing to bear. You've got in the opening of Luke's Gospel two different stories of the angel Gabriel announcing pregnancies and birth. Um, the first one is the announcement to the old priest Zechariah while he's serving in the temple. And so he's serving and he's in what's called the Holy of Holies. It is the sanctuary where Yahweh was known to dwell, a place where perhaps encounters with angels would be expected to some extent. And so as an old priest, Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth have never had children. So when, when Gabriel comes to him and announces that Elizabeth is pregnant and there is going to be a birth, it is the birth of, of John the Baptist, we know that this is an announcement that is full of blessing and full of joy. There's no scandal for this couple, but instead they would have been seen by the community as having received a great blessing from God. Um, this pregnancy of Elizabeth is in many ways similar to the pregnancy of Sarah with Abraham. Uh, even the pregnancy that is told um, of Samuel's birth, of, of how Hannah begged and pleaded to be able to become pregnant and promised to, to give her child over to God. You know, these, this story of Elizabeth falls very much in line with the stories of these women from the Old Testament who were desperate to have children. And so, so we see the blessing and we see the promise of God very easily in those stories. And then we get to the second announcement of Gabriel in Luke, and it is, it is for another birth, another blessing from God. Um, but this one's scandalous, right? Um, perhaps you've experienced scandal in your life in some form or another. You know, the, the out-of-wedlock teenage pregnancy is, I think, cross-culturally seen as, as just beyond words. You know, it's, it's not something that we, we take out banners and celebrate for. Um, it's anything but an easy burden. It's scary. 
There's so much unknown. And never mind what society is going to be telling this young girl, this, this teenage Mary, when it comes to being pregnant before she's even married. There's scandal, there's whispers, there's stares, there's judgment from everywhere. But after Gabriel's announcement, you know, Luke actually writes that Mary goes out to visit her, her relative Mary, her, that Mary visits her relative Elizabeth. And, and I read that and I can't help but think with this teenage pregnancy, did she choose to go visit her family or was she being sent away to try to hide the scandal, to try to keep the gossip in the neighborhood down? There's no way around the fact that whenever the marriage was going to take place to Joseph, people are going to be able to count the months and know that this baby was born out of wedlock. There's no way to slice it. Um, there's no way to make it pretty. Gabriel, though, greets Mary by saying, Mary, God's favored one. Alan Culpepper writes in the New Interpreter's Bible Commentary, though, that Mary, God's favored one, was blessed. She was blessed with having a child out of wedlock who would later be executed a criminal. Gabriel's words to Mary as, she, as he's greeting her, they make no rational sense. Perhaps you can relate to this confusing message. Um, you know, when, when you contrast the circumstances of your life with the blessings of God. Perhaps you've been touched with the challenges of a teenage pregnancy, either yourself or someone you love. Perhaps you know somebody like Jesus who was unfairly labeled a criminal and persecuted unjustly. Maybe it's just that in your life, things just seem so unfair, so unreasonable, and so scandalous by the world's standards that the thought of ever being called favored by God seems impossible. You know, this morning is supposed to be about peace. And I gotta tell you, this message from Gabriel, this promise of what is a blessing but seems to be only a scandal, heartache and trouble, it seems like anything but peaceful. When we peel back the layers that I think the church has sort of put over it over the years. You know, this story is so familiar, but then if we look at what really is happening in the life of Mary, it really makes me want to ask a whole lot more questions of God and of Gabriel than what Mary asked. I mean, if I'm being honest, if God were to come to me through, through an angel and say, hey, guess what? These are your circumstances. I'd say, no, thanks. <laughs> you know, I can, you, can, you can give that blessing to somebody else. I'm not, I'm not looking to be scandalous in the world. But thankfully for all of us, uh, Mary, who was made of a lot stronger stuff than me, instead of running the other way when Gabriel told her what was coming, she just asked the one question. She says, how is this possible? I'm a virgin. She's satisfied then when, when Gabriel tells her, Holy Spirit's going to come and the Most High is going to overshadow you. It's like, oh, sure. And so Mary says simply, here am I, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. There are a couple of things about Mary's answer that can really help us to understand how we can approach things in life, how when, when we are challenged, when the scandals and the unfairness and the unjust things that are going on in our lives, how can we approach those things and find peace? Number one, Mary's response tells us that she is choosing to participate in God's story. She didn't try to negotiate the terms of what she was being told. There are examples in the Bible where, where people actually try to negotiate with the angels. Um, Abraham and Gideon are two great examples from the Old Testament where, where they're being told what's going to happen and they, they negotiate terms with God. Even Zechariah, who was standing in the sanctuary of the Lord, Earlier in Luke's gospel, he's standing there and he's talking to the angel Gabriel and he goes, how is this possible? I don't believe you. But not Mary. Mary's response is simply, let it be according to your word. Now, I don't want you to think that I am suggesting we respond to circumstances of injustice or oppression and think that those kinds of things are the will of God in our lives. The circumstances of injustice or oppression that Mary would have faced 
were not from God, but rather from what I am saying the world would probably bring to her. We can see in the life and actions of Christ that he opposed any forces that, that were oppressive for any forces that were, were keeping people bound and captive, that, that through Christ we know all circumstances of oppression should be broken and people should be made to live freely and fully. So, so what I'm saying then about Mary's response is that in her words, um, she is willingly stepping into God's plan in her life. She is willing to face the challenges of her pregnancy and know that God is with her. Her willingness is because she knows that God has brought her to the mouth of scandal. God has brought her to the cliffside edge, if you will. And as she's about to jump off into what is an unknown, crazy world, uh, God is going to faithfully carry her through the burdens and through the trials to come. Christmas and the advent of Christ as he was conceived all those years ago was only possible because Mary was willing to participate in God's plan. I believe strongly in the free will of humanity, um, that we worship a God who wants us to participate, but does not force our compliance or actions outside of our agreements. And so Mary's response reminds us today of the magnitude of what is on the line when it comes to participating in God's will in our lives. The body of Christ in the world today is only made possible because of our willingness to participate in God's plan. We are the hands and feet, the flesh and blood who do the work of God in releasing the captives and setting the people free today. The will of God is only ever made possible because we choose to let go of how perceptions and judgments of the world influence us. Instead, we follow the way we hear God leading and we respond like Mary saying, let it be with me according to your word. But what about peace? You might be asking again right now, what does any of this have to do with peace? Our peace is found in our relationship with the one who calls us. Mary understood this, that we cannot experience peace, the shalom of God, apart from our relationship with God. Because Mary trusted God, because she believed God, she was able to surrender in that moment. It is because she was in relationship with Yahweh that she had the peace, the shalom necessary to risk the scandal of an out of wedlock teenage pregnancy. Today, my friends, today our peace is in the incarnation itself. God chose to become flesh, to step into the wickedness, the brutality, the corruption and brokenness of the world. God chose a teenage girl living in an empire where she was not even counted a citizen. A teenager seen as unremarkable and worthless by all accounts. God chose the lowliest of means to come into the world knowing rejection, shame, violence, and humiliation would come. But God chose that. We know that God, because God chose that, we know that God also chooses to be with us, to be with us in our brokenness, in our corruption, in our shame, rejection, and humiliation. God is with us in those things, my friends. The incarnation is where we find our rest. It is where we find our hope, our joy, our love, and our peace. Just as Mary knew all those years ago, God is for us yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We know that it is in the presence of God in our lives that we are filled with peace. It is in the presence of God in our lives that we will have the peace necessary until such time as the kingdom fully comes on earth. And for that, my friends, I say thanks be to God. Amen. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Prince of Peace, we come before you today filled with the anxieties of what the world calls the holiday season. We know
know in our hearts that this is your season, the Advent season. And yet we find ourselves pulled into the influences and perceptions of the world around us. We see the scandals of lives, lives dedicated to you, lives with the, which the world judges by standards which we know should not bother us. But even still, we fall short of realizing your peace because we get pulled into these unjust judgments and views of the world. Forgive us and help us to remain faithful in our trust on your ways as higher. Lord, we are hurting. We are sorrowful. We are missing the hope, joy, love, and peace of this season. We look around and the world is something we do not recognize. We cannot go about our lives freely, constrained by this ongoing pandemic. Some of us look around and we do not see the faces of our loved ones. Some are missing because of quarantine or safety measures, but there are others we cannot see because they are no longer in this world. Our hearts are heavy with their loss. We turn to you now, Lord, for comfort, asking for you to fill our hearts, fill our souls with the peace that passes all understanding. We know these losses cannot be changed, yet we also know in you there is comfort, healing, and peace even in the pain. Help us to lay our lives down saying along with Mary today, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Let us each give our lives over now to follow where you may lead, that we may be counted as good and faithful servants. And so with the confidence of the children of God, we come together now praying the prayer that you taught us, saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen And now, as you go into the world, rest in the presence of the incarnate God, knowing that even as your life may seem scandalous to the world, a life lived to the glory of God is a life that finds favor with God. And as you go, know that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit go with you always. Amen.